so much Ole, good evening good evening good evening good evening it's nice to have you all here i am actually still in the process of getting dressed for the live but i figured i could put on my earrings while um while i'm here lincoln say wait until you get your headphones yeah lincoln behave yourself the man come back yourself that's not ready all right. Listen, Ole, Ole can't talk to me this evening, you know. Ole can't talk to me this evening. Christopher, we ain't a build no life now. The life go build for itself. Right. Okay. So, folks, good evening. Thank you very much for coming and joining me again this Friday evening. It was lovely to be with you all on Sunday. I hope you all like my earrings. These are. Oops, this one kind of flip. It's courtesy Bowl Design. So let me give Bowl Design. It's spelled B-H-O-L Design. So it sounds like Bold Design, right? Maria Bola, the Calypsonian. Maria Bola also does these items. And she did a pair of earrings for me. But it's going to be part of merch, right? I'm going to have it as merchandise that you can order from me so that you have your new source earrings those of you that are interested in new source earrings and it gets even better than that there are more mugs more mugs that are being designed right so mugs and cups don't worry don't worry mugs and cups coming very soon you will have the opportunity to have earrings like mine and to have a mug like mine. So when you come and you sit down and you're taking in the hearth box, you two can sip tea. Right. So we're getting into it. I just had to organize pricing and Ollie will be able to make all your orders and them kind of things. So and we go sort things out. Nice. Nicely done. So there are a couple things that I want to do this evening. There are at least two issues that I want to speak to. One of them, of course, is the Stanley John report and big up to Tech Guy and his artwork. I have to say, Tech Guy, he do um, he do he do let me down when the artwork finally reach. I just had to nag him, right? Nag, 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 nag. Level amounts of nag this had to take place. I had to get up, send a message, threaten all kind of thing. But when the artwork reach, it puts a smile on my face. So big up to Tech Guy. And his artwork the first thing I want to touch on actually before I jump into it all you here and my good and thing right I just want to make sure everybody here and my good right hi Maria y'all this is Maria this is Maria of bold design anybody who not sure who Maria is this is Maria Bola here of bold design go to her Facebook page go to her Instagram page like her please because I am very pleased about this. Actually, let me give all of the story behind this. So, I had given Maria my number because she organized for a courier company to drop these things off. The name of the courier company is Trips. I believe I have that correct. So, the courier company had the wrong number. So, these things were supposed to have arrived long before they actually arrived. And then... We eventually made contact with each other, ironed out what had gone on with respect to the numbers and the numbers not being absolutely accurate. And then the items arrive. Now, I wasn't sure what was the gift. Because if you all see this courier that show up on my doorstep to drop off this gift, I thought he was the gift. And at a point in time, I was there thinking to myself, Maria, real like me, boy. <laughs> this nice man she said on my doorstep, just so. And then he eventually um, went down into his vehicle and pulled out a bag, a very nice bag. And he said, well, I'm here to deliver this to you. So I was like, oh, he is not the gift. It's what's in the bag that's a gift. 
you should have seen this brother. Dark, smooth skin, real polite and thing. Anyhow, homeboy arrived with this and with the earrings all nicely packaged, right? So if at any point in time, y'all need to have a courier, there's Trips TT Courier and they did a very good job on that day. And the, the delivery guy, at least that delivery guy was very easy on the eyes. And so I'm just, just saying, just saying. Maria, I thought the fellow was the present. I just saying, all right? That's what I thought. I thought, <laughs> I thought he <laughs> was the present. And I will end there. Anyhow, so let's, um, let's move back to, to the topic at hand. So on Sunday, I would have done part one of the Stanley John report. And I want to continue the Stanley John report. But before I jump into the Stanley John report, I feel for two seconds, just two seconds, actually, no, maybe, maybe a little bit more than two seconds. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? For a minute or so, let's talk about this guy. Because for the life of me, I saw this video today, this morning, and I couldn't believe the foolishness that I was dealing up with. So let's get into it. CEO Anthony N. Sabga III says government's role is to facilitate business and not be in business. He says this is except in the case of extraordinary need to protect national interest or to avoid economic collapse. Speaking at AmCham's TNT Economic Outlook 2022 forum held virtually today, Mr. Sabka explains. It is well known that government ownership of private companies has been notoriously, sorry, has been notorious for low productivity, wasting resources, and distorting competition. So I'm going to pause there for a second, and we're going to walk through this stupid man i'm going to make an effort to be a good child this evening only pray for me i'm really going to make an effort to be a good child this evening and i'm going to make an effort to be a good child this evening because this gentleman is a citizen of trinidad and tobago and i'm going to try and be as respectful as possible in the face of his massive disrespect to us some of you all don't know him i know him and the first time I encountered him was about 20 years ago when he was kidnapped. And we, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, would have footed the bill for the anti-kidnapping squad to have to go and find wherever he was and secure his release. And then, of course, thereafter, his parents would have sent him abroad to, to, um, to keep him safe, right? So that's the first time I encountered this individual. And I actually, for a brief period of time, maybe about six months or so of, of my life, worked at a company that fell under um, Guardian Media Limited, and he was the person I was put in charge. He was the, the CEO or the, the manager or whatever. So at that point in time, everybody used to refer to him as Baby Sabga. That was his nickname, Baby Sabga. So this is Anthony N. Sabga III. And Anthony N. Sabga III, if I'm, I think I'm, yeah, but Baby Sabga. So this is Baby Sabga. And Baby Sabga is of the opinion that the government, the state, has no role to play in business. Now, it's a really interesting perspective and point of view that persons like him and business people like him come with every so often. They believe that the whole point of the government is there to provide them with money and allow them to do whatever it is they want with state um, resources with things that we generally ought to own. So a government or a government system like ours, where there are a number of things that are state owned and the state continues to protect so that, so that the public doesn't have to pay wild astronomical prices based on supply and demand and the markets that business people can manipulate bothers the business class. So I want to, I want to get back to the start of what he said, right? I want to go back to the start of what he said because I need, to, I need to point out 
the first oxymoron. And thereafter, I'm going to continue with the rest of the moronic statements that he's making. Then I'm going to ask him a couple of questions. Please. It is well known that government ownership of private companies. If it's government ownership of companies, it's not private companies. You stupid fuck. Right? If it is government ownership, that's state ownership, and therefore it's public. It's a public company. It's not a private company. But here's the issue with people like Anthony N. Sabga III, right? Ansa Macau Group CEO. You don't want the government to own companies, to have a say in and an impact on the market because you want to be in a position to exploit the market. So that's why... Every so often, you and your cronies, you and your cohorts are going to launch a tax at the state. Furthermore, you launch a tax at the state using your media houses and your media companies. And you know what is ironic about it? These very conglomerates, these very group CEOs, these very corporations that have an issue with the state playing a role in the economy and the state playing a role in business, look at their business practices. They are never the ones to actually raise minimum wage. As a matter of fact, every single time minimum wage is raised or improved in any form or fashion, it's by the state. There is never a private company that steps forward and steps up and says, you know what, let's raise the minimum wage for our employees and therefore put pressure on the government to raise the minimum wage any uh, 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 higher. They are never leaders when it comes to improving the lives, improving the, the remuneration package of their employees. Further to that, and I could tell all of this for a fact, one of the lowest paid sectors in Trinidad and Tobago is media. One of the lowest paid set of employees in the country, media. Anthony N. Sabga III, what does he preside over? One of the things that his, that his Ansa Macau group presides over would be a media house. Not just print, television and radio as well. Lowest paid, some of the lowest paid employees in the entire country are media workers. You think that it's paid a journalist and them any set of money? No. That's why so many of their journalists are so compromised, constantly looking to see where they could get handouts from. And oftentimes the handouts that their employees are looking for come from the state. Why do you think from 2010 to 2015, 63 months, the then government was able to have so much of the media in its pocket? Why? Because media, especially private sector media here, very poorly paid and constantly on the lookout for handouts from public sector to be able to get by. So private sector employees in media houses like the ones that Anthony N. Sabga presides over, does need to turn to the government for housing. That's why you have all of this bacchanal about journalists and HDC housing. Employees that work for Guardian Media Limited that fallen under Anthony N. Sabga, who have a whole problem with the government playing a role in business, just had to wait for hamper from the state. Just have to hope that they could, you know, get a little cacada from, some, some, from somebody in government. So Anthony N. Sabga and them need to pack down. When you could turn around and tell us what you are doing as the private sector with respect to improving employee compensation, improving the, the, the conditions under which the people that work in your corporations are under. When you could talk about what percentage of your employees in the private sector actually fall in the category of poverty. All you remember the other day, I remember the other day, the Miss Will participant, she talked about poverty and she talked about 60,000 people being below the poverty line here. Who are letting them 60,000 people working for? I could tell all you, the 60,000 people that fall in below the poverty line, they may, they may 
they ain't working for the for the public sector the majority of those persons when they have jobs they are working for the private sector that's where they're working because the wages in the private sector are generally very low so when you see persons like Anthony N. Sabga III coming to complain about government and government's role in business. Pause and ask yourself a couple questions. If Anthony N. Sabga, if Sabga and them was responsible for Wasa, how much money all you think all you have been paying for water? Ask all yourselves that. If Anthony N. Sabga III and Ansa McCall was responsible for companies like TN Tech, what do you think the electricity bill was going to look like? Yeah? If Anthony N. Sabga and Ansa McCall was responsible for education, which is something that used to be in private hands, I don't know if you all know this, but there was a point in time education was controlled here by religious organizations, and state-funded education was something that only happened around the 1940s. So, if Anthony N. Sabga and Ansa McCall would have been responsible for things like state education. We all think school fees would look like. Stop and think about some of the major security firms in this country. Who owns some of the major security firms in this country? Who are some of the lowest paid persons in this country? Security officers, security officials. So Anthony N. Sabga and them need to arrest me. When you all want to be complaining about the role of the state in business, you need to be talking about it from a position of persons who not actively using the power to pressure the government to give you all preferential access to things like foreign exchange and contracts. Until you could do things like that, until you could wipe the grease from your mouth, until the grease that has been dripping down your wrist and dripping down your elbow, elbow until you could get rid of that grease, from you there lining up by the treasury to, right? Until you could do that, hush. Nobody want to hear all you. Nobody really want to hear all you. You all have been fat and living off this space for far too long. If the state is involved in business and the state is involved in business in a manner that allows for protection of the rest of the population from parasites such as yourself, you need to have a problem with that. I really didn't have a problem with that. I remember what it was trying to do to FCB, you know. Me I forget that FCB IPO at all. Me I forget it. And I know, I could tell you for a fact right here, that many business people just be jockeying when the day come to get preferential access to foreign exchange. And when they feel they can't get preferential access to foreign exchange, what do they, what do, they do? threatened to put front page headline stories in newspapers to make government officials that are blocking them from trying to get access to foreign exchange. So they threaten state officials and say to them, if you ain't do this or if you ain't do that or if you ain't do the other, negative headlines for you. Right? Me a stupid. I know precisely what is be going on. I am clear on the level of parasitism that has come from business persons like yourself. So I find for you to jump out yourself and jump onto your own television platform, your own media house where your very workers are underpaid. Plenty of them scrunting when the month come and you want to be talking about the role of government and how government does lead to excess and poor services. Half the time government services are poorly distributed. It's because persons like yourself corrupting the process. Right? Disgusting. So I just, I needed to get that off my chest because I saw that video and I thought to myself, this man have some nerve, boy. He has some real nerve to be presiding over a company where some of his employees are some of the lowest paid persons in the country. And you complaining about government presence in business? No damn shame, no? None of them have any shame. You know what? I feel Sunday is to talk about poverty and to talk about the role of persons like Sabga and them 
in poverty. So I'll see how I can manage that. In any case, what is we really here for? You're here, all you, I know all you show up because all you want to, all you want to talk about this next guy. <laughs> Somebody just sent my message to say they don't like the idea of me dressing in front of everybody else. I do beg pardon, sir. I will behave myself. I'll be I'll be a better child. I will I'll make amends later. Alright, I'll make amends later. I actually no, let me not say I want to get a cocktail. Maybe I do want to get a cocktail. Maybe that's what it is I aiming and angling for. In any case, let's move on. Only here for the hot box. So let me give all the hot box. So Sunday, I do my live. And of course, as is to be expected by Sunday night, Monday, he was all over the place. Keyboard Banton, right? Motor mouth all over the place. And so this was him on TikTok. Assassinate the character of Gary Griffith. Dance how you killed this. I understood the assignment. <laughs> I understood the assignment. I understood the assignment. I, I understood the assignment. I understood the assignment. Listen, Gary's still reeling from that cocktail on Sunday, you know. And the thing about it is, Gary has decided that he is the victim in all of this. And, you know, it's one of the things that I've always found interesting about narcissistic personalities. People who are narcissistic will always decide that everything is about them. They have, they always have to be, they always have to be the center of everything. One, and they always, they all, they have to always be getting praise. And when they're not getting praise, they're consistently under attack, consistently being persecuted. All right. So Gary shows up on TikTok, posts this video on TikTok. You have a whole set of videos on TikTok. I not on TikTok. Other people on TikTok and they send things to me from time to time. So they send this and it is a it is a stream of it's a stream of yeah. just no, just no. Let me let me start it. Let me let me let me stream it this way for you all to see. So he starts up with that the, the assignment is to assassinate the character of Gary Griffith. And we all need to understand is this. Gary then proceeds to to run a stream of images of front page newspapers because of course he vexed with the express because of the denise ryan story every single one of those stories are about issues that were actively reported actively reported where there's documented evidence to support all of the things that were put into the newspaper stories documented evidence of things that griffith himself actually did or actually said right and Griffith then decides that he is the victim here, right? He is the victim, you know, and crying down the place. It ain't have a media house Gary ain't hit this week, you know. In some instances, some of the media house he hit multiple times for the week. That is the extent of his victim syndrome. So Gary, in one instant, is the bully, and in the next instant, is the bold, <laughs> right? Gary Griffith. Dance how you kill this. I understood the assignment. I understood the assignment. I understood the assignment. I, I understood the assignment. So let's get into the Stanley John report. Right? Let me get into the Stanley John report. <sighs> Gary need to arrest me with your foolishness, yes? Where do I want to start? Which page number do I want to start at? When the prosper say good night, we in front by the stage. Yes, good afternoon, Skinner Park. All you good? Right. Let's get into what's the first thing I want to go to. Right. This I'm going back to the report. I want to read an excerpt from a particular page because the real crux of the report for me is tied around all of the mystery that surrounds this particular person. So I'm going to read from it. 
A very disturbing feature of this investigation was the unexplained role of Ms. Vindra Dukey in relation to activities in the firearms permit section. Both she and the Commissioner of Police have been unhelpful in explaining her role and have adamantly refused to proffer any explanation to me, this is retired Justice Stanley John, for the numerous documents relating to FULs found at her residence. The Commissioner has not performed the functions entrusted to him by law in relation to the issuance of firearms. To use his own language, he depended on the integrity of the system, a system which he admitted had serious flaws and opened itself to corruption. The commissioner admitted that he simply affixed his signature to the letters of approval prepared by the firearms permit section. In fact, he was simply rubber stamping the recommendation of subordinates. So this is from the report. And the big question being raised here is... Oh, all is not well on that end. Okay. Y'all hearing me? Check, check. Any issues? Tell me how we're going on all the end. Right, Patrice said, right. I'm seeing other people saying they're hearing me loud and clear. Good, cool. I hear in myself loud and clear as well. So I was a little bit surprised to hear that. Right, and other folks are saying to me that they've heard me loud and clear. Right, good. But I'm just going to take these off in case it was causing any problems with the headphones. Right, so back to the report. So there is that. There's that bit there that I would have read for you, where they raise questions about Vindra Dukey. So, of course, now what I have to answer for you is this question. Who is Vindra Dukey? So, first thing you might need to see is a photograph. <laughs> Somebody say the complainers need Q-tips. All right. So Vindra Dukey, when you do a quick search, is or was the marketing officer at Security Analyst Services Limited. For those of you who don't know or aren't aware, Security Analyst Services Limited is the security firm that Gary Griffith owns. So Vindra Dukey, who was hired as a secretary in the TTPS um, headquarters, also worked as an employee in Security Analyst Services Limited. And this is a company that was owned by Gary Griffith. So this is Vindra. This is what Vindra looks like. This is the lady in question. Now, back in, back in 20, I want to pull up that story for you. There's a story that I want to pull up for you. So just give me a second here. Let me pull the story up. Right. Mm -hmm. Back in 2018, when Griffith, not too, around the time that Griffith would have been would have been would have known that he was going to that he was going to be the commissioner of police. He was interviewed and he was asked a question about whether or not everything would be above board with him because he had a security company and everybody knows that when you have a security company, the companies have to apply through the commissioner of police for FULs or for FUECs. So Griffith would have answered and he would have said that everything was above board. But I want to go down to a particular paragraph. Because in this story, they talk about um, how the company and the shares for the company would have been switched over to his wife's name. And then after that, to persons who, has, who have the same last name as his, as his wife's maiden name, Dyer. So the impression given is that members of Nicole Dyer's family um, took over as, as um, 
directors of the company. So I wanted to get to this particular paragraph here. So it says, under the, leader, under the heading of leadership, he alone is listed. And a 12-page document shows his achievements as a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment for 14 years, National Security Advisor and National Security Minister. Under the meet, heading Meet Our People, Gary Griffith is listed as a Security Consultant Executive, Suzanne Dyer as CEO, Gerard Dulam, the Operations Manager, Bindra Duki, they actually meant Vindra Duki there, the general manager, and Joy Dyer is listed under finance division. Why am I talking about all of this? Because I want you all to be clear that Vindra Duki is somebody who is linked and related to Gary Griffith. She has a relationship to Griffith prior to the TTPS. Now, according to... According to... According to the documents that I would, the, according to the, according to the Stanley John report, Vindra Duki worked as a secretary for the TTPS. And in the report, they would have asked Griffith on numerous occasions if she held any other positions. And certainly if she held any other positions within the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And Griffith refused to answer. So then here's this interesting piece of information. Vindra Duki, on the 18th of December in 2019, was made a special reserve police. And so if Ms. Duki was made a special reserve police back in 2019, it means that when the investigation into the FUL corruption took place and Justice John asked to interview Ms. Duki, she ideally should have presented herself for questioning and to answer any questions that the investigators and they would have had because she is down as an SRP. So she is, <laughs> she, she is an SRP. And she's there as an SRP. There's another, there, I mean, there's, documentation to show right that she was precepted back in december of 2019 so i want to know if vindra duki is precepted right so she's inspector um, woman inspector um vindra duki under the, the 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 srp order then the, the srp act then why did she not present herself before justice john to answer questions and why Further to all of that, has there been all of this refusal from the former commissioner to indicate whether or not Ms. Duki had different services within the TTPS? Because there's all of this, there's all of this secrecy surrounding her job, her role. The, 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 the report consistently says that she's a civilian hired to work in the TTPS HQ as a secretary and now you're seeing that when you know i almost a year well actually yes a year after griffith became commissioner of police he would have made her an srp a woman inspector on a, a srp and she precepted right so now let me get into let me get into to some more, and the other interesting thing is that Vindra Duki also sits as a director on Nicole Dyer Griffith's various NGOs, All right? So she's definitely somebody that the, the family holds in high regard because she's sitting on, an, on, on at least one NGO that I am aware of that's there. Um, the information is there in the public domain. So let's, let's get into... The, there's an appendix to the report, and the appendix is 10 pages long. And in those 10 pages, they focus on what was found at Vindra Duki's home. So at her home, there were a number of documents. There were a lot of documents found at her home. So it says, blue booklets, so people's FUL booklets, 
and they name the person, so the, the people, who the owners of the booklets, their names are here. Six envelopes containing photographs of five persons, and those persons are named as well, right? And a number of the persons named are some very high-profile names. And then 19 photographs were also found, four of which would have had initials behind the photographs, I guess to indicate who is the dealer or whatever it is, and passport pictures. Then there were about 39 forms found um, in the names of, follow of, of persons, and all of the persons are named. As a matter of fact, some of the names resemble the name of the person who he was just talking about in the um in the media report there uh and we, we have let me see how many names i've seen here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty there are at least twenty names here now what the report seems to imply based on this information is that these persons all of the names that are here are persons whose files were being fast-tracked. Now, if you remember what we discussed last Sunday, people were paying a processing fee for their files to be fast-tracked. And so that's the implication here. So let me read some bits of this for you. They said various documents and folders were addressed to a dealer with the initials HLP right and that dealer there's a letter in one of the documents that gave authorization to take a hundred thousand dollars out of a bank account um, linked to the dealer whose initials are hlp there was also a single sheet of paper with the heading again hlp and nine names listed with five digit numbers alongside each of the names and this was retrieved um, at the house as, and addressed to Ms. Dookie, right? Along with FUL books, um, import permit requests, um, requests for new firearms and additionally there were handwritten notes um, about which persons were to get the FULs, provision, provisional and otherwise as well as um, names with correspondence dated from 2019 coming forward and a range of things. So you've got the names of magistrates in this file. You have the names of business people in this file. You have the names of um, um, senators and MPs um, in this file, right? There's also a number of questions about bullet and bullet caliber that's being raised in, in the report as well, because apparently bullets that would normally be used by sniper type rifles, people were being allowed to purchase those kinds of rifles and they were purchasing those rifles and the ammunition to go with, these, with those rifles and claiming that they needed those weapons for personal protection. So sniper type weapons, sniper type ammunition, but the reasons they were giving when they applied for those things was for personal protection. So not necessarily handguns, right? There's not handguns they were applying for, not pistols they were applying for. They were applying for, for guns that would normally be used in sport training or used by snipers. All right, depending on the caliber of, of bullets. And the reasons that were given was personal protection. Um, some of the, uh, to go on with respect to some of the documents that would have been found at Vindra Dukey's home, there would have been import and export requests, permit requests from the US Embassy in Vindra Dukey's home. So you have to pause now and ask yourself, this lady who is or who was a secretary attached to the TTPS headquarters who according to um, LinkedIn and, and, and searches done online uh, was a, an employee with 
the security firm that Gary Griffith um, owned or probably currently owns, why does she have all of these personal documents? Well, not personal, sorry. Why does she have all of these sensitive documents? Why does she have all of these applications? Why are all of these forms in her possession at, and in her home? Why are these things not in the fire, the firearms unit? Why are they by her? And in all of this, in this entire report, Griffith is claiming that he had no role in anything else at all but to function as a rubber stamp. That's what Griffith says. So Gary spent all week long wanting to know how people get the Stanley John report, why they have the Stanley John report, who leak it, and insisting that he must get the report. So I want you all to be clear on something here. Gary himself spoke in this report. I wanna, I'm want to. i going to scroll now and find um, where he was interviewed. Because Griffith is pretending that he wasn't interviewed for the report. And he was. He was, he was interviewed numerous times. And he's well aware. All right. So let me read this bit. Acting Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith acknowledged that he met with me. This is um, Justice John speaking here. In my capacity as the investigator on at least two occasions prior to his departure from Trinidad. The first meeting was held at the Office of the Police Service Commission, where he outlined to me his function as commissioner with respect to the issuance of firearm users' licenses. The following is a summary of an interview conducted on Wednesday, the 6th of October, 2021, via Zoom. So there are at least two meetings that took place, one face-to-face -face and one via Zoom. Yet this entire week, Griffith keeps talking as if he is unaware that he gave evidence to this investigation. And then he keeps insisting that he is supposed to be given a copy of this investigation. The investigation does not only gather evidence from Griffith. This report gathers evidence from a whole slew of members of the TTPS. So is it that all of the other persons that gave evidence before uh, that gave evidence for this report. All of them supposed to come now and demand a copy of the report and threaten to sue? And the report at no point in time accuses Griffith of anything. It doesn't say that Gary received a bribe. There is nothing in here that says that Griffith received a bribe. There is nothing in here that says Griffith instructed anybody to receive a bribe. I have never said that Griffith received a bribe. I have never said that Griffith instructed anybody to receive a bribe. I will eventually read out for you what the report says again, and then you will understand that a hit dog will holler. Because at no point in time does this, does this report point directly and say, Gary Griffith Jr., or Gary Griffith III, whatever you know, he, he, he government name is, Right. At no point does it say that Toppy is the person who collect a bribe. So let me finish read. Let me finish read from the report for you. So the following is a summary of an interview conducted on Wednesday, the 6th of October, 2021 via Zoom. I told Mr. Griffith that the interview was being recorded and that a transcript of it was being taken by the cat reporter. Bear that in mind. It was being it was being rec re recorded and a cat reporter was doing a transcript. He agreed to recap his role and function as commissioner of police with respect to the issuance of firearms licenses. Justice John, we have met on at least two occasions before, Mr. Griffith. Yes, we have. Justice John, for the purpose of the re for the purposes of the re re record, I would invite you to explain what is your role as commissioner. Mr. Griffith responds, he says, sure. How it is structured is that the commissioner of police has the only input really and truly for the commissioner of police is the end result. Two things, the end result to sign after it has gone through a comprehensive process from the applicant submitting it, be it FUL, FUEC, provisional or variation, 
So all the other elements as it pertains to the applicant submitting it goes to the police station. The police will then do the background check, the due diligence, and forward it to the FUL department. The FUL department will then do their comprehensive checks and then they will forward it to the compliance unit after everything is done. The commissioner of police has no involvement in any of these things. And he keeps repeating this throughout. All that the commissioner of police has invest involvement in is the end product. This is similar to the Minister of National Security when he signs work permits. The only thing that the Minister of National Security, his only input as it pertains to work permits, even though it comes under the Immigration Department, it comes to him for signature, probably about 100 every week. And the reason I know that is because I was in that chair. So, let me pause and break that down for you. Gary is insisting, uh, then when he was commissioner of, acting commissioner of police, that if any bribe was passing, if any illegality was taking place with respect to um, FUL, the issuing of firearms and, and the processing fee that people were talking about, he knew nothing about it. He had no role to play. He did nothing. Mind you, in other parts of the report, in other parts of the self-same report, there are officers who are saying that Griffith instructed them to do things that were in breach of the Firearms Act, namely allowing dealers to come down to the unit and somehow get into the section and get involved with the passing of files back and forth. And how the information and how the how how the process for this entire thing has been recounted in various parts of the of the investigation is to indicate that the dealers themselves and the persons who become dealers become dealers by permission from the commissioner of police again the persons who become dealers are the ones who are charging the processing fee and then the file goes into the firearms unit, the, 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 the fire permit section. And for some reason, Vindra Duki, a person attached to the commissioner's office at the headquarters, would be in that section collecting files. And we know that she has been collecting files because according to this report, the TTPS went to her home and found a heap of files for different persons with the dealer's names on things, with information on the backs of photographs and on envelopes. And all of the names are highlighted in the report. The dealer's names, the, the client's names. So of course now, the question is, did money pass hands or did favors pass hands? Were people passing money to be able to get FULs? Were people also providing favors and accommodations to be able to get FULs? Those are some of the questions that need to be asked here. And it, for me, it matters little that Griffith want to run up and down and grand charge and talk about he's suing this one and he's suing that one and he's taking this one and that one to court. You go ahead, brother man. That's your freedom. That's your right as a citizen in this country. We have to be grateful, you know. That the government ensures that there's a judiciary and a legal system that you can have access to in that way. But there are still a lot of questions to be answered. So, there's another interesting thing that I noticed, that I picked up on. So, I told you all just now that the name of Griffith's security company is was SAL, right? S sorry, SAS, yeah, SAS um, Security Services Limited. Let me go back and check that to be absolutely certain. Right. Security Analyst Services Limited. Now, a couple months ago, when I was doing some checks, because these aren't things that I do overnight. I mean, some things might happen in short order, but other things I'm always checking things and always looking at things, right? So, when this whole FUL story had broken since last year in 2021, I had started doing some checks. Remember, I just told you all that the name of the company was SAS Limited, right? Security Analyst Services. 
I'm going to share my screen and show you all something. So last year, when I was doing some searching, I bumped into this company on that was on 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 online that was talking people through selling a book about how to get your FUL approved. Now, here's the interesting thing about this company. This company not registered in Trinidad and Tobago. This company, SAS Man, S-A-S-M-A-N, Sales LLC, is a company that is registered in Florida, right? So imagine my confusion to see a company that registered in Florida, in the United States, where to me, the bigger market for selling guns would be the American market. But you have a company registered in Florida, and the company was registered in Florida somewhere around April last year. So April 2021, and at least one of the directors of the company is a Trinidadian, right? So there is this Florida-based company called S-A-S-M-A-N Sales LLC. And one of the things that they're doing is talking people through or helping Trinidadians through getting their FUL approved. So you pay for this book and, it, and you download it and it talks you through the process, right? So that is, that is the, that is the, the website then because me and just look at the website alone i went and i you know i do a, a search on the company and that's how i found out that at least one of the directors um is is oops, 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 oops. one of the directors is is a trinidadian so then i went to their page and i thought to myself but this is the oddest thing you have a florida-based company and this Florida-based company not focused on gun sales to the United States at all. Rather, it is focused on gun sales to people in Trinidad and Tobago. And so you when you go through their page, you realize that there's a lot, there's a lot of targeting of our audience here in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, I wondered if a local company with the SAS initials possibly had any sort of connection and links to this Florida-based company that was providing a lot of guns and gun accessories to Trinidadians. I just wondered. I have no evidence to say that, you know, the two things are connected, but I did notice that the director for the SAS for the Florida based company is somebody who is who was affiliated with the TTPS here, right? So, is a I the person was a police officer, maybe they're not still a police officer, but the, the person one of the directors was a police officer and now has this Florida based company. I'm not saying that the company is doing anything illegal, I just wondered if there was any connection at all, especially when I saw the similarities in the company names, right? Just wondered if there was any connection. So in looking at this report, there are a number of things that struck me about the report. It struck me that you had a well-connected network within the TTPS. I don't think that charging people or, bri you know, accepting a bribe for FULs started under Griffith. It didn't start under Griffith. I'm not that naive, I'm not that stupid to think that these things started under Griffith. Not at all. I feel that Griffith would have shown up there and met all of that taking place. However, in the time that Griffith was there, the three-year period that Griffith was there, the number of FULs issued blew up by 400%. The report indicates that right the percentage of guns the number of guns the number of fuls the permits and everything went up by 400 percent 
people were charged even for provisional licenses and you're not supposed to be charged for provisional licenses so they were so people were paying a fee to get a provisional license as well as paying a bribe to be able to get guns so of course now you look at the fact that this thing seems to be comes across as a whole industry you have police officers who are charging a processing fee you have um, dealers firearms dealers who are reliant on the police service the commission of police to allow them the license to be able to provide firearms you have them then providing this whole this full service um, processing of applications then you have police officers who themselves have started up gun ranges so you have the sale of guns you have the bribes associated with with firearms you have people becoming dealers overnight you have the setting up of these gun ranges you know overnight as well and then you begin to see that easily easily there seem to be a whole industry a cottage industry that sprang up in within a three-year period so this industry built itself and if there is any connection between the industry here and that florida based company then the industry that cottage industry surrounding fuls didn't stop here it started to go international and in the midst of all of this you have a business community a business class that likes to think of itself as being above board and in a position to criticize and critique everybody and talk about who in who efficient and who inefficient and when you look at this report the majority of our business class seem to be jumping up in this processing fee racket so you now have to pause and ask yourself how extensive is white collar crime in this country boy has white collar crime overtaken violent crime might it be a situation where white collar criminal activity is even more rampant but it's real important and real necessary for these media houses to carry on every day about who get murdered who get shot this this um robbery that took place but not necessarily carry stories about the wildness that taking place with bribes for firearms right and bribes to be able to become fuel dealers nobody ain't covering that in the same way nobody does be doing a count of how much white collar crime take place so every day on the front page of the newspapers you will see the murder count but you don't see the white collar crime count right you don't see the white collar crime count at all sabga come to jump on and talk about government shouldn't be involved in business business shouldn't be involved in corruption sabga Dilemma to call names now because I read the report, you know. <laughs> I read the report several times. Dilemma to name names. Dilemma to jump out and say things. Dilemma to post paid copies of the pages. Right? All you're real good to be jumping up and carrying on but government, this government, that government, the other. And you have a whole report here that have names that implying that these people may have paid bribes to be able to get a firearm. And then some earlier ain't even submit proper applications to be able to get all your firearm. Thing missing, documentation missing. But then all you want to play holier than thou and better than everybody else. And a three-piece suit choking you on your fat neck. Anyhow, Olya, that was part two of the Stanley John report. I felt that I needed to wrap up and tie up some of these things and to get you all to understand why the whole business of Vindra Duki played such an integral role in this report. So I will see you all on Sunday. I will try and discuss something light on Sunday. All of these heavy topics, you know, it is, it is bring me down sometimes. I'll be thinking to myself, this is just too 
you know it it it, it could be heavy sometimes anyhow i want to say have yourself a good evening <laughs> sir i want to you you get mad mad shut what the fuck yeah there's an old story. No, you can't take it no more. Give me money, who money you give me before? No, I can't, I can't take it no more. Give me money, who money you give me? After half, I take off a girl with some love over me and then take it for fun. Then we come back and we go talk to Blossom and she got left me too long, running around. Searching for a girl I couldn't get.